Even the maps aren't prepared for this. Lots to talk about. Shamar Freeman Powell is with Sky News and she's in London for us. Dr. Shada Chakraborty is climate behavioral scientist who works with We Don't Have Time, an online platform for climate solutions. And Tim Miller is a writer at large for The Bulwark and an MSNBC political analyst. Good to have all of you here. Doctor, these temperatures are insane. And frankly, we aren't built for them. We aren't built for the impact if they keep getting worse. After years of you and your colleagues warning about climate change, what's your message now today? The message is that this is what we anticipated. It's exactly what we saw coming. And there hasn't been a more urgent time to act than now. We have such a short window to curb off this dangerous trajectory that we're on, which is increasing the global average temperature by degrees, which doesn't seem like a lot. But what that means is that the jumping off point for extreme temperatures for these 105 to 110 degree Fahrenheit days, that's making those deadly days more uh, frequent and more intense and more simultaneous. We're seeing this in examples from the Pacific Northwest to the uh, plains of America to Europe. This is something that we are experiencing now as a global collective. I'm at the UN today. We are launching the neuro non-border respecting risk that is intense heat. Well, we're looking at some pictures now, Shamarn, from Greater London, the fires that are raging there. Not only are people not used to this kind of weather in Europe generally, but the homes and buildings were built for a completely different kind of climate. There are lots of homes in the UK, frankly, where they're built to retain heat because it's often so chilly and so damp. What kind of problems is all of this creating? major, major problems. And let me just put that into perspective. As you said, today where I'm stood in West London at Heathrow Airport, we recorded temperatures of 104.5 degree Fahrenheit. Now that beat a record that was set in 2019 and that was 101.84 degree Fahrenheit. But usually in this country, when it gets to around 65 degree Fahrenheit, that's when you see people wearing the short sleeve tops and those short shorts as well, because we can see that to be quite warm. So getting to 104 degrees is shocking and we are not prepared for this in this country at all. And because of that, a red alert warning was issued to warn people of the dangers because there is a danger to life if you're not prepared for this type of heat. We've seen the impact on our transportation systems. Yesterday at some of the airports, at one particular airport, they had to suspend flights because of damage caused on the runway because of the the heat. The airport, the RAF airport, also had to do the same because the tarmac on the runway had melted and it's also had major issues as well to our rail transportation with many lines having to be cancelled because they're too hot. And then I could even speak about our National Health Service, the NHS. They also have to put in precautions to ensure that, that, that things run smoothly there as well as operating rooms were too hot to operate in. So some routine appointments have been cancelled and as you say most of the homes in this country do not have aircon and I can tell you last night my room was very hot indeed and temperatures reached the highest levels than we've seen overnight here as well and as we say we're not prepared but we are hearing from scientists that we could potentially expect more summers like this in the future so the question now is what can be done about it well let me go to the doctor then because that she's setting me up for that. Is, is this what we're going to have to get used to? And what do we do about it? Well, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to adapt to the changes that we know are coming, that are already underway, and that we anticipate increasing in frequency and intensity. That knowledge is power. It allows us to proactively prepare for what we know is going to be increased risk to human health, what's going to put a detriment to the food supply system, and make certain foods less available and accessible. So we need to address the nutrition issue globally. We need to think about the impacts on biodiversity, what this means for nature, and all of that can really be planned for. And so let's let's see the positive there. Now, at the same time, we need to mitigate against worst case warming scenarios, because at some point, we're not going to be able to find solutions to this runaway heat and to the many impacts of climate change that 
that are ripple effects from this temperature warming. So let's actually proactively prepare and adapt to this new temperature point from which we can anticipate continued and increased hot days around the world. And let's prevent real worst case scenarios from coming into reality. So Tim, if we're looking at worst case scenarios, let's be real, the politics around climate change policy, about as hot as the temperatures, especially since there are still plenty of politicians who think climate change isn't real. I, I wanna read what the Washington Post said about that possible administration action. Quote, some climate activists have urged the White House in recent months to deploy an emergency declaration to maximum effect arguing it would allow the president to halt crude oil exports, limit oil and gas drilling in federal waters, and direct agencies, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to boost renewable energy resources. Theoretically, at least, Tim, that's what the president could do. Does it look at this point like his only option, unless you tell me some folks are having an epiphany, seeing what's happening and deciding we have to do something? Yeah, boy, look, I, I get a little bit conscious of, of, of demanding that presidents do extreme actions via executive fiat um, without having any help from Congress. I think you always have to wonder uh, what does that mean when the other party is in charge? Uh, you know, obviously, we have a system of government here that we need to work within. Uh, I, I think that also, I think Biden politically is going to be hesitant to take some of these actions right now just because of domestic political concerns about high gas prices. You know, is this really the time to be limiting? Um, uh, you know, oil and gas yeah. production and politically, right? And so I, I think that there might be a congressional action. I mean, this is a climate action. This can happen through reconciliation. So this is one issue that the filibuster doesn't matter. So obviously they're waiting for like the smoke signals to come up from Joe Manchin's houseboat. And it'd be nice if Joe Manchin would just sign on to something. But if he doesn't do that, is there something, is there some of this agenda you could get Susan Collins on board for? She's not up for six years in Maine and has been on as part of climate um, co uh, compromises in the past. Uh, you know, you don't want, you wish you wouldn't have to put all your eggs in the Susan Collins basket, but, you know, given the extremity of the problem here, if you want a long term solution that can't just be reversed by the next president, get, you know, finding one Republican to sign on for this would be nice. Obviously, the fact that you have an entire party that is, that is run by climate deniers is disgusting and is, is problematic right now, but, but the Democrats really only need to pick off one if they can't get Joe Manchin. So let's bring this back to the U.S. I want to bring in Jay Gray. He is in Texas, which is considered ground zero for the extreme heat in this country. Jay, what are you seeing and feeling there? Chris, good afternoon. And almost half the country dealing with extreme heat right now, but some of the worst of it is here in Texas. The Dallas area expected high today is 109. It would be the second day in a row that North Texas reached that mark. And there's no real relief in sight at this point. The 10 day forecast shows only one day below 102 in this region. There's concern about electricity. It's putting a strain on the grid. There's also concern about water with mains breaking because of shifts in the dry ground cracking pipes look they're going to continue to do what they can to try and help those who are forced to be out in this heat uh, but it's something that's not going to go away and, and so long term what a lot of the forecasters in this region are saying is that this is really just the beginning of what's going to be an even hotter summer as we move forward not good news for those here in texas and as we talked about a across the country that are dealing with the excessive heat. That's the latest from here in Dallas. Chris, back to you. Thank you so much for that, Jay. So, Tim, let's let's go back to the political reality. I mean, Ted Cruz in Texas is not suddenly going to change uh, the way he thinks about these things. I want to show you, though, a New York Times headline because it speaks about really how it's not just a problem here. It describes how at the debate for the race for prime minister, they talked a lot less, almost nothing about global warming and more about how to blunt the impact of spiking energy bills, to your point, as we were talking just a minute ago. It is very hard in politics to play the long game, isn't it? Yeah, this is a we have a global polarization on this issue. I, this was not the case 15 years ago. Uh, you know, when obviously the Democrats have always been more more forward footing on environmental stuff, but there were Republicans. Like John McCain ran in 2008 on wanting to deal with climate change. This was true of European conservative parties not that long ago. So the polarization on this issue is a disaster. And and you know the only way to break this off is is a like I said, pick off the few you know uh, members of conservative parties, Republicans here in the states that might be 
be willing to work with something, or winning elections uh, you know, in some of these red states. I look at Texas, just this disastrous uh, you know, grid situation in Texas, on top of the other extreme laws that they put in place on abortion and other issues. Uh, like these need to be places Democrats need to find a way to to win elections, and and that's just unfortunately the reality of the climate debate right now because you have one party that's not going to participate in any sort of solutions, um, you know, not you know not even more moderate or more reasonable ones that that, that certain Democrats might want to go along with. Yeah, among the many things that are not built for these kinds of temperatures, power grids in many places. So, Tim, thank you very much. Shamar and Freeman Powell, my apologies for having you stand outside with us for 15 minutes here. Dr. Shada Chakraborty, thank you as well. Good luck with your meetings at the U.N.